Hello and welcome to the June UN Info Session. I'm Alex, an intern with the San Diego chapter of the United Nations Association. Uh, today we'll be talking about oceanic health, which is of particular importance in San Diego County. We all know that it's a big part of our lives. But furthermore, on Monday, June 8th, we'll be celebrating World's Oceans Day, which is a movement to celebrate, protect, and preserve Earth's life support systems. And so today we're very lucky because we're joined by three experts at once. We have Brady Bradshaw of Oceana, Dr. Sarah Jean Royer of the Scripps Institute, and Susie Bear of Clear Blue Sea. And so firstly, I'd just like each of the speakers to briefly introduce themselves and explain their interest in preserving oceanic health. Go ahead, Brady. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, we've, it's been great working with the United Nations Association uh, San Diego chapter in the past, so I appreciate you bringing me on. Um, my name is Brady Bradshaw. I am the campaign organizer for Oceana, located in Southern California. And um, basically our, our mission, we have a couple uh, missions right now. One of them is to stop the expansion of offshore drilling. Um, I have a dog barking back here. Um, and one of them is to ban the trade of shark fins in the United States. And we just launched a, a new campaign to eliminate single-use plastics at, in past policies at, this, at the local, state, and federal level. So my name is uh, Sarah Jeanne Royer. Uh, I'm a scientist and I've been working on plastic degradation in the environment for about 10 years now. I was previously based in Hawaii uh, working on plastic degradation and the emissions of greenhouse gases coming out from plastic in the environment, not only in water but also in air. So any types of plastic are actually producing these greenhouse gases and I'm also uh, highly interested in uh, microfibers and the effect of plastic industry and textile on the environment. So I, I right now I work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and we have a project where we are looking at the biodegradability of different types of textile in the environment including synthetic material, natural, biopolymer based uh, such as PLA and we are looking at how long it takes to degrade in the environment. I'm also interested in other topics such as uh, the lifetime of plastic in the environment and also the effect of fishing gear on plastic pollution in general since we don't have a good hold of how much fishing gear is out there in the environment compared to other sources of um, plastic such as single-use plastic. And uh, yeah, so that's the research I do. And I, I like to get my science outside of the scientific community uh, to impact like, law and policy makers for taking better decisions in the future. Hi, I'm Susie Beer from Clear Blue Sea. Um, I think you've done a great job of uh, setting up this panel because I think of Brady as being um, in his policy work being preventative uh, to prevent more plastic from going into the ocean and Sergeant for researching what the extent of the problem and the niche that we decided for ourselves primarily is remediation and so our nonprofit is Clear Blue Sea I'm the executive director and the co-founder and we are building autonomous solar-powered marine robots to clean up plastic in rivers, which would be preventative, uh, bays, estuaries, and the ocean. So we're very minimally funded. We've had over 200 student interns, which has enabled us to build three prototypes. And we have some professional volunteers that help mentor, but it's basically the younger generation hard at work um, at Clear Blue Sea. We're located in San Diego, and this year we have three main projects. We're designing what we call, well, our, our robot is named the Floating Robot for Eliminating Debris, or FRED. And this year we are um, designing a FRED 50, which is 50 feet long, which can be done remotely, which is awesome. 
we are finishing up our Fred Jr., which is 16 feet long for um, operation in San Diego Bay. And by the way, not just cleaning, but we expect to give whatever we collect to researchers <laughs> because when the San Diego debris study was done, um, it was just a very small sampling. Uh, so in the beginning, we'd like to give samples to researchers. And then our third one is called Fred in the Public Domain, where we're developing an instructional package so anyone can build Fred anywhere around the world. Great, thank you so much to each of the speakers for being here and for such thorough introductions. So I'm wondering if we could first start by covering the importance of the ocean in general, what it does for the environment and for humans, and what we see as the biggest threats to its health. So whoever would like to start with that, maybe Dr. Royer. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess uh, for myself as a marine biologist, um, the ocean is essential for any human being. And um, I mean, one of the reasons it's like it, it's a reservoir and it's what regulates our temperature on Earth. Of course, right now we are going like beyond where climate change and rising of temperature has become a huge issue. And I, I guess that's why I thought that our unexpected discovery when uh, we were uh, looking at the emissions of methane coming from biology, we made the unexpected discovery that actually plastic is emitting also these greenhouse gases. And today with this huge amount of plastic production that will keep on increasing at least until 2050, according to the projection, we should be doing something about all of this plastic because it's actually linking not only plastic pollution, but all types of plastic to climate change. And um, for the ocean, I mean, there's a limit to what the ocean can do for us. And at some point, um, if we keep on producing this plastic that is not only polluting our water, that is actually entangling and killing wildlife, but also now emitting greenhouse gases, uh, the ocean won't be able to keep up. And uh, yeah, that's the, the art of the planet. So we need to, to be very careful about how we treat the ocean. Great, thank you so much. So Susie, you spoke a bit about Fred and Fred Jr. and how these um, autonomous solar powered marine robots work to clean up plastic pollution. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about the oceanic gyres that I know your organization is focused on and where you're working to clean plastic pollution. So having spent 10 years at NASA where we had very complex um, vessels, but space was easy. In the ocean, making the robots is easy, but the ocean is very challenging. And so we thought it would be um, jumping the gun to have the first thing we built be a 100 foot Fred, which is our our vision is to have hundreds of freds that are 100 feet long in each of the gyres because they're so massively huge and they're just growing bigger every year because plastic continues to be dumped. And so it just amasses and amasses and decomposes and decomposes as a mess. Uh, so we have prototype two six footers and one 16 foot, then we'll do the 50 footer and then we'll do the 100 footer. And we expect um, the robots, to, well, we planned for the robots to be pilot, piloted around Hawaii uh, because there's so much trash circling the islands and they have to manually clean it up all the time, as well as prototype or mission control center out of Hawaii uh, to monitor each and every FRED in their operations. And they can clean up trash autonomously, but if they get into trouble, then remote control can take over. So what I like to say is that it took 50 years to create this mess. It'll take 50 years to clean it up if we're lucky. And it'll take at least 50 different innovations. So we don't think FRED is the answer. We think it's a possible answer. That's great. Thank you so much. Can I, uh, can, yes, can I add on to both of those questions just briefly? Um, 
I forgot to mention that I'm a, I'm a free diver and I'm a competitive free diver and I'm out in the ocean training a lot near, uh, near Scripps, right over there near Scripps um, in the canyon. And I just want to say like every time I'm diving, I see plastic, but I don't, I don't see plastic every time. I don't see fish every time I go diving. Um, and for many people in the world, they're experiencing already the percentages of their haul and fishing gear is a large percentage of it is plastic. Yeah. Um, and so I started cleaning up plastic trash many years ago. I noticed that it hasn't gone away. So uh, our, our um, approach, and thank you, Susie, for, for saying that everything that we're doing is so important. Um, and we're gonna need it. We're gonna need everything to tackle this problem. So, Oceana's focus has been just to it's been source reduction. Um, as a as a policy uh, nonprofit, we, we're we're wanting to stop the 17.6 billion pounds of plastic that enter the marine environment every year uh, to stop entering from land-based sources. So, our focus is really to stop it before it enters the waterways. Thank you so much, Brady, for those examples. And I'm curious who you think is to blame for the majority of this plastic pollution that enters. A lot of people talk about consumers or industry or the fishing people who enter the water. So what do you think? Well, I guess I would start not with a who to blame, but more of a, like a, a what happened to blame. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there that would be pretty quick to sue the pants off of us if we started calling them out, but um, we're just a nonprofit. But anyway, um, there was a fracking boom over the past decade for natural gas that has created this huge abundance of, of natural gas and um, plastic is a product of petroleum and natural gas. So we have uh, this, this glut of, of fracked natural gas that we need to do something with that industry has decided they need to do something with, excuse me. And um, the message has really been from industry, uh, you should do your part and recycle, but other than that, there's not really another solution. However, recycling is only, only globally solving about 2% of the problem because only 2% of what we try to recycle ends up, ends up getting recycled. So um, everything else is landfilled or uh, incinerated or ends up just in the environment. So um, really we just need to hold the companies accountable and we need to hold our governments accountable to start regulating these, this output. Great. And what do you think are some of the most encouraging outcomes that you've seen from Oceana's single-use plastic bans and where what potential does that have moving forward? Um, I actually want to point to the state of California for the success. There's been over 120 cities, I believe, probably more now, but they have enacted some sort of single use plastics phase out or ban. And this is setting the stage for a national policy. We have um, Congressman Alan Lowenthal from Long Beach uh, has actually introduced a bill at the federal level called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And it's a really comprehensive bill that has extended producer responsibility and a lot of um, economic incentives to start to fuel that, uh, that transition at the national level. And we're leading the way in California at the local municipal level. So um, I think we're just setting a great stage in Berkeley, California's ordinance is a really good example of that. I'm near Berkeley right now, so that's encouraging. <laughs> So, Dr. Royer, Sarah, would you mind explaining some of your research on the greenhouse gas emissions from plastic? Because I think that's um, an innovation, a scientific innovation that most people aren't familiar with and don't know why gases would be emitted from those plastics. Yeah, absolutely. So I touched upon the topic a little bit during the introduction, but uh, so I've, I'm a biogeochemist and I've been studying during my PhD, like gases in the ocean and dimethyl sulfide and CO2. 
And uh, when I moved to Hawaii, it was to work on methane and other gases. And uh, we decided to look at the concentration of methane coming from seawater, so from the biology. And we discovered that the concentrations of methane we were looking at, they were 90% higher of what we were expecting. So we went back to our experimental protocol and we realized that uh, actually it was not the seawater producing most of the methane, but the bottles in which we were incubating seawater and the bottles were made out of plastic. So that was an unexpected discovery. And from there on, I asked my supervisor, Dave Carl, if I could work on this topic as I thought it was important. And I already worked with plastic before. I created this group Run and Care in Barcelona in Spain, where we would go running in the morning and pick up trash along the beach left by the tourists and the people just eating and partying there. So I was already very close to plastic pollution. So we started investigating on the topic and we looked at the seven most commonly used types of plastic and all of them were producing methane, ethylene, ethane, propylene, CO2, and CO. So uh, I went and I continued researching and we discovered an LDP, polyethylene was the type of plastic producing the most. Uh, it was very scary because um, polyethylene is actually the most produced, consumed, and discarded type of plastic in the environment and the one producing the most greenhouse gases. So it's a little worrying. And uh, I, de I decided to focus only on LDP. And then we compared plastic in the pellet form and then in powder. And we realized then for the same amount of plastic, when we look at powder, and pellets, we get about 500 times more methane produced from the powder, which means then as plastic degrades in the environment and becomes smaller and smaller, there's more surface area that can actually react with UV light and then there's more methane that will be produced. And methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. That's why I decided to focus more on methane, but there are other gases produced as well. And then the last experiment I conducted, so I'm an oceanographer, so most of my experiment was basically using plastic, incubated in seawater, milky water, but then we decided to run the same experiment, putting the same amount, same type of plastic in air, and it got really scary because there was about three times more methane produced with plastic exposed to air rather than submerged in water and 76 times more ethylene, C2H4, that will be produced uh, if we look at the plastic exposed to air. So for this specific topic, we no longer think only in terms of plastic pollution in the ocean, but we are thinking of all types of plastic exposed to air. So greenhouses, landfills, the swimming pool, our cars, everything that is actually outside and exposed to UV light and that reacts and with, due to photochemistry and photodegradation will be producing these greenhouse gases, which is bad. So we need to do something and we need to act quickly because right now it's projected to keep on increasing at least for the next 30 years, which is a disaster. And it's not only a disaster because of the plastic itself that endangers our life, wildlife, but also for climate change. So yeah, that, that's a summary of what I've been working on for two years uh, at the University of Hawaii. It's such fascinating research. And so I'm wondering if you could take a step back and explain, you know, it's, it's, methane is first of all significantly more powerful than carbon dioxide um, in the greenhouse gas like warming effect and and then also that has an impact on our oceans and produces ocean acidification so i'm wondering if you'd be able to explain briefly what ocean acidification is and why that's so damaging to oceanic health yeah absolutely so methane when we we think of methane we think about the methane that is produced in water, outside of water, that will go into the atmosphere. So part of the methane may be consumed by bacteria and uh, species itself in water. But once it touches um, the atmosphere, this is where it has a bad effect on, on the climate itself. Um, when we think about ocean acidification, these are slightly different chemical reactions. Uh, for ocean acidification, it's more like a reaction with CO2. Uh, but saying this, we have also CO2 being produced by plastic and ants uh, may impact uh, the acidifi 
acidification of the ocean itself and harms coral reefs, as we can read a lot on, on social media and in, in scientific literature. So uh, the coral status right now in the world is, is pretty bad. In Australia, in Hawaii, uh, when, when we think about the damage of the UV light and then the acidification of the ocean on, on the coral, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. And uh, right now we need to act not only with methane, but also with CO2. And we know the contributors to CO2. And it's something that is hard to control. But uh, hopefully in, in the future, um, we'll see a, a decrease with time, which is not the case at the moment. But we'll have to find fast solutions to, to solve this other issue as well. Great. Thank you. So Susie, um, you mentioned a bit about what Clear Blue Sea does, but I think that it's interesting that you're one of the innovators who's working to help clean up this plastic pollution. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that and the importance of that and the importance of integrating these younger folks that you talked about. Uh, so my sense is that as a baby boomer, that we are leaving you younger generations with a big mess. Uh, and so it's very important for us to teach young people that they can tackle global problems in their own lives. Uh, I also teach creativity and innovation at SDSU and that's what that class is all about. And so at Clear Blue Sea, besides teaching them about ocean plastic and different innovations for cleaning it up, we also teach them systems engineering and project management. So when, after their internship, they will be much more effective in their careers going forward and hopefully in an environmental space. I wanted to add that um, because Fred is solar powered and is a very big platform, then it will also include sensors and instrumentation and actual water and air sample gathering equipment because it would be a waste not to collect scientific data and samples while out there also cleaning up the ocean. So we've talked to actually Dr. Dehane at Scripps and other people um, who would like uh, when we have a, a larger FRED to put their scientific um, instrumentation on our robots. Uh, so they can collect data with greater frequency and greater volume, especially from the middle of the ocean where it's very unsafe for humans to be out there. Uh, and we, so we hope that Fred will end up doing educational work um, through our internship program. It will support research. And with a lot of the evidence that we gather, it will inform policy. So, we do see this just as Scott mentioned as an integrated approach um, to address it. We're basically going to have to throw every discipline at it that we can. Um, it's not a single discipline problem and it's not a single discipline solution. Awesome. So you mentioned that one Fred is based just outside San Diego where Dr. Royer had been researching. And then you mentioned another that's in the San Diego Bay. So what, what kind of impact might Clear Blue Sea have locally in the San Diego region? I think it's mostly spreading awareness of how much plastic is really out there and what kinds of plastic and where it's coming from. Uh, We've talked to people in the, San, uh, in the Tijuana River, um, government agencies that are down there, and when it floods from rains, uh, the Tijuana River has a, a net that floats up on um, and catches all the debris that comes down, except for biological, of course. After the rains subside, they go in and manually clean up all that trash which is also unsafe medically. And so we want to try Fred out um, just cleaning up the trash for the humans uh, after it's captured um, in, at the mouth of the river after a rain. Um, and also just to learn more effective ways of doing that. So we're imagining that the kind of 
not only plastic pollution, but scientific data that we collect from the San Diego Bay and the Tijuana River um, will just give more credence and hopefully more media attention on our local pollution. Great. So that makes me think, um, you know, cleaning all of this plastic waste that ends up after rains in the Tijuana River estuary region. And I, you know, Dr. Royer's research on how GHGs uh, are emitted in both land and sea. So I'm curious, Dr. Royer, what do you think is the best way to contain these plastic pollutions, um, landfills, but those admit as well. So I'm curious what you think. And I think Brady mentioned how few plastics are recycled, so. Yeah, I mean, if you would ask me personally for, because now I'm working also with synthetic materials and textiles, so this is another game. For plastic in itself, for me, single-use plastic should be banned. And of course, right now we work a lot with one item at a time. I mean. So some states, they are a little faster, but uh, when we think in terms of, uh, I don't know, a, a straw or just a cup, uh, if we do it once, uh, every three years, a new ban comes and then you work so hard to get these items banned, etc. cetera, um, it will not be fast enough to sort this issue. So personally, I think that single-use plastic should be banned. And um, I know it's, it's, a, it's a hard one, uh, but the way I see it, these single-use plastic, they are like just for a convenient lifestyle. We use them a few minutes, then we throw them away. A lot of them might end up in the ocean and escape from different facilities through the way. Like in Hawaii, we see single-use plastic a lot along the Waikiki Beach just because, I mean, the tourists, they will throw some items in the trash. The trash doesn't have a lid and then you have wind and then it goes everywhere. So um, this is a huge issue and uh, it's the same with the landfills. And if we look at it, 40% of the production of plastic is for single use plastic. So, and these volatiles, I mean, they are not volatiles, but they are very lightweight. Usually get, they can travel fast. They are different than a fishing net, for example. So if we can deal with this better and ban eventually in a relative fast way, I think this will help a lot the state of our ocean. Um, if you take the plastic bottles, for example, uh, the density is higher than seawater. So they will go straight down into the water column at the bottom of the ocean. And these are things we don't even see, but they are there. So uh, plastic bottles, they are a huge issue and uh, we are not there yet to, to replace them. Uh, but I do believe that with time, if we bring awareness and then we educate the consumers so they make better choice and they, they buy these, harder type of bottles that they can last forever. So it's basically reducing their own carbon footprint by doing so. If we bring this awareness and we work together with law and policy makers, this will help. Uh, for the landfills, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, you would, if, I don't know if, if the, the listeners, they saw the story of plastic and uh, they've been looking at documentaries with issues with landfills in Asia, for example, but this is a gigantic problem there. And I wish I would have the answer, uh, but I think we need to start at least by like removing these single use plastic from, from the market. So at least part of the problem is addressed and find like more sustainable solutions like before the, the second world war. So. Uh, but yeah, it's a tough question. Maybe uh, maybe Brady can can discuss it a little bit more. But uh, yeah, landfills is a, is a big big issue. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to chime in, um, especially um, with I, I used you mentioned that this is something I hear quite a lot is that it's really there for convenience. Uh, so we use plastic as a convenient item, and it does look that way from the surface. But when we really think about the, the global impact. Uh, Single-use plastic is extremely inconvenient in so many ways. It's only convenient um, for the producers of plastic that need to, to find a, a place to pump their fracked natural gas after we've produced too much. And it's, it's been, um, you know, impacting. I, and we, we see what's happening today with Black Lives Matter movement. I want to tie that in too because um, a lot of the petrochemical facilities that are built to produce and process plastics are built in communities of color 
uh, and they're impacting communities of color disproportionately across the US and at the end of their life cycle, I mean, in unimaginably inconvenient for people who are living on the island nations that have to deal with the, sh the plastic that we ship there um, because we have this illusion that we can just send it away. Um, it does end up in the ocean, it does end up impacting uh, animals, but it's also an extremely toxic substance for human health at the beginning and the end of its life cycle. So um, we really need to reframe that um, from being a convenient item to being actually unimaginably inconvenient for so many people along its, its pathway. Um, even restaurant owners, I would say it's inconvenient for, they have to pay for the, these products consistently and may, they may not know that it's that it's uh, affecting the bottom line but I would think that a dishwashing system and some reusable items could end up costing a lot less than having to continually buy styrofoam and buy all of these all these products um, not to mention the waste hauling and how much it costs taxpayers to to fund cleanup programs um, in California taxpayers are now paying 420 million dollars a year for the cleanup of, of waste. So um, it's just something that we've built a system around plastics, but it doesn't need to be that way. Super interesting. Thank you for that addition. That was really enriching. Um, I'm taking a bit of a shift towards some more of your uh, work with Oceana. So first, I'd like you to talk about your offshore drilling ban movement and what offshore drilling is and what its environmental impact is. Yeah, I was, I was chosen by the offshore drilling movement. Um, I was just visiting uh, a friend's house in Alabama in April 2010. And if anyone remembers the BP oil disaster, I hope so. Um, it was on April 20th, 2010, and we got the chance to fly over the spill and witness it firsthand. So um, from that day forward, my life has changed and that's why I'm here. Um, offshore oil drilling is extremely dangerous and it's a dirty practice that um, currently the Trump administration is working to make even, to even lessen the regulations, um, which is actually infuriating there are a lot of these dates coming around like the 10-year memorial of the spill and during that day the Trump administration was working to decrease regulations for safety after you know those 11 11 human lives were lost on that rig explosion that day um, 10 years ago so it's just flying in the face of all of the all of these really important dates um, not to mention um, anyway I won't go into the other damages that are happening because of our current administration to the ocean and otherwise but um really this started under president obama there was a there was a proposal to drill off the east coast um and this was because the east coast governors of states were pushing for for offshore drilling and it kind of felt hopeless at that time because the, administ the Obama administration was moving forward with a plan to do seismic air gun blasting, which is extremely damaging to the, um, the hearing of a lot of marine mammals and a lot of even fish species and plankton. It, it's, a, it's a sonic blast that is really loud. Um, that's, and so there's all of these stages of the process for offshore oil drilling as well. Um, but since then, we've had over 380 municipalities uh, passed resolutions opposing offshore oil drilling, and 50,000 businesses have formed an alliance to say we don't want offshore drilling off of our coast on the Atlantic, Pacific, and Eastern Gulf of Mexico. Um, every single East and West Coast governor now opposes offshore drilling. So we're kind of like building a wall <laughs> against tr President Trump's drilling plan. Um, and it's it's kind of, um, it's, it's insane how blatant the disregard is for all of this opposition, this really vocal opposition that's coming out. Um, wow, that's yeah. tough to hear. Um, certainly feels hopeless, but I'm very glad that there are advocates like the three of you to be um, so dedicated to causes like this. Uh, another topic I wanted to discuss with you is your work in the shark finning ban. 
so what shark finning is and how the U.S. ban has impacted global shark populations. Okay, yeah, and I, I feel like I left you with a little bit of a, a sad note there. I want to, I'll touch back on some cool stuff that's happened. Um, but first I'll start talking about shark finning. Um, shark finning is extremely wasteful and it's a brutal practice where um, people, fishermen pull sharks on board, cut off the fins, and can sell them for a lot of money. Um, it's a global trade, and every year, about 73 million sharks have their fins end up in the global shark fin trade. Um, the United States has banned shark finning in our coastal waters, but we still support the global trade by allowing the sale of shark fins in many US states, and we import and export shark fins. Um, so we really haven't solved the problem just by banning shark finning, we really need to go all the way and ban the sale of shark fins in the U.S. And we, and the House of Representatives did pass a bill this year um, that would ban the trade of shark fins. And it was the most, it had 270 something co-sponsors, which is the most co-sponsored bill in, uh, ocean protection bill in Congress this year. Um, and then the, the piece about drilling was we also passed through the house a permanent ban on offshore drilling on the east and west coast and the eastern gulf of mexico but both of those bills need, still need to um, find their way through the senate and get signed into law great well i'm glad that there's some hope in that regard thank you for noting the the positive changes um so i guess just wrapping up i'm thinking about moving forward um, Brady, we can start with you. What do you think are some of the most important advocacy efforts that people can get involved in to help protect oceanic health? I'm going to give people a very specific advocacy effort. Um, and this has to do with our, com our conversation about plastic is so relevant and so um, important. And um, in San Diego, you can always check in with your local uh, city council to see if they've, pa they've passed an ordinance and put them on task to pass an ordinance reducing or eliminating single-use plastic. But we also have the federal, um, the federal bill, which has taken off this year. And every, every representative from San Diego has co-sponsored the bill, except for Representative Scott Peters. Sarah John, that's, that's your representative. So I don't think he's against it, but He's, he may need to hear from some constituents of his district. Um, so pick up the phone and call Representative Peters and ask him to co-sponsor the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Awesome, thank you so much. I love specific <laughs> target points. I can do that right after this interview. Um, okay, then Susie, what do you think are some of the most encouraging or exciting movements that you've seen with Clear Blue Sea in terms of tackling uh, plastic pollutions in the ocean? Well, there are two things, uh, two categories. One is education. Last year, we educated over 1,500 school kids without trying. And I have grandchildren uh, that completely understand uh, protecting the environment and not using single-use plastic. Kids can learn this stuff at the, at the kindergarten level and up. And I think it will need like a, a tidal wave from younger generations to just not tolerate killing the planet um, for the, in all the ways that we are. And so educating younger generations is paramount um, to changing all the paradigms about, uh, you know, what makes the world go round and whether it's economics or politics, all, all of it needs to change to save the planet. There's no doubt. Um, one thing I'm encouraged by is how people are creatively using recycled plastic for good use because it's here rather than burn it. Um, in Europe, they're building bike paths out of it. In Indonesia, um, we've talked to the Indonesian delegation. Uh, number one, they have a $1 billion budget for ocean plastic cleanup. We have 10 million. I mean, it's pathetic uh, at the federal level that we're not funding more programs. Um, and they learned that in making new roads, if they 
include about 10% plastic. It makes it more durable without fracturing. And people make shoes and rugs with the plastic that we already have, you know, recycled plastic. And I, I expect that to take off more and more and more, that younger generations won't buy anything unless it's sustainable. Uh, and they will affect the economy in that way and careers and politics. And so my hope is with the younger generations um, to basically take hold of the power that they have and may not know about yet um, to basically save the planet. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for working to, you know, empower the younger generation, because I think mm -hmm. any support to young people really goes a long way. Yes. And finally, Dr. Royer, you spoke about how you use your research to also inform policy and you're working to hopefully ban single use plastics. But how do you think some of your results will guide future research and future policy? And what recommendations do you have for people who would like to influence those things as well? Yeah, uh, so I guess, yeah, you're completely right. When I'm talking about the science I do, I really want it to be expanded outside of the scientific community. Otherwise, uh, it just stays between us. So I think especially for plastic pollution and plastic production in general, uh, this is super important. Um, and uh, as Susie mentioned, uh, education and bringing awareness is really the key. Uh, for influencing the consumers. However, I don't see this as the, the fast way of doing it because it takes time. Uh, in Hawaii with Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, we may educate like 10,000 kids and students every year, but it's not enough. Uh, but of course, the generation, uh, the future generation will be there to support what we are trying to like change in, in the world today. Um, but it's, it's really hard to have uh, consumers changing the old habits, especially when we go, I don't know, above 20, 25. I mean, consumers, they already have their habits and it feels like hard to convince them to change them. So yes, I think the law and policymakers, they need to hear us and see what's the issue and change their agenda accordingly. And for this, they do need scientists and they need to have results and prove that this is bad. So I will keep on pushing uh, with this for sure. And saying that now I'm more involved with the textile industry and I'm really trying for consumers to realize that we are consuming way too much. <laughs> this is not normal to have like, I don't know, to buy about two pieces of cloth per week and then uh, use them less time, buy more. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And given the fact that 62% of our clothes nowadays are made out of plastic, this makes this problem even greater and it, it's not a good thing. So yeah, my future plan is not only to fight to stop single use plastic, but it's also to fight for being aware of uh, the equipment that we use uh, with the fishing industry. Most of it is plastic, hard plastic that lasts a long time in the ocean. I mean, they have the reasons. I mean, they don't want their equipment to break, but it needs to, we need to have better regulation because you go out there in the ocean and people they can do whatever they want because it's so fully regulated and I mean there are reasons I mean the ocean is huge but uh, the ocean has a limit and uh, saying that I'm also interested in making some changes and encouraging consumers to use more natural products for clothing and garments so these are like the three main thing I want to work uh, on in the future and use my data for influencing the policy makers. Awesome thank you so much. So in order to tie everything we've learned back to the sustainable development goals themselves, I prepared a brief presentation. So here we are about oceanic health and the SDGs, sustainable development goals. Firstly, the sustainable development goals are 17 goals. They were designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They're, they were adopted by all the United Nations member states in 2015, and it, it's called the 2030 Agenda because it involves um, very specific actions that nations and governments and local municipalities should take uh, in order to enhance the prosperity of everybody by 2030. 
So firstly, I'll talk about SDG 14, which very directly connects to oceanic health, its life below water, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Um, as Brady mentioned, when he's free diving, he doesn't see a fish every time, but he does see plastic every time. Um, and that's probably indicative of the statistic that World marine fish stocks have declined from 90% in 1974 to only 67% in 2015, um, and probably even less now. Humans threaten the ocean through marine and nutrient pollution, resource depletion, and climate change, and these threats degrade the oceanic biodiversity and natural infrastructure, which can be seriously impactful to um, like global socioeconomic problems for societies that rely on the ocean for employment. So that's why our next is SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth. Over 3 billion people in the world depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods. However, today we only see about, we see up to 30% of the world's fish stocks overexploited, likely even more. And um, that is just a completely non-sustainable yield. And unfortunately, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and shark finning um, are some of the greatest threats to sustainable fisheries and the livelihoods of those who depend on them. Then we have SDG 13, climate action. Um, the ocean, Dr. Royer briefly mentioned that the ocean acts as a reservoir and it, it does, it absorbs about 30% of global carbon dioxide produced by humans, which is very beneficial to buffering the impacts of global warming, but we are overproducing greenhouse gases to the point where it's causing ocean acidification and it's, it's, achieve, it's reaching a limit where it can't take much more. And then finally, that's why we need to ensure that we are consuming responsibly and producing responsibly, hold, holding industries accountable, um, calling into our governments to try to get them to ensure that local businesses are being held accountable and banning um, single-use plastics. And so I would just like to thank our speakers. Um, and more talks like this can be found at the United Nations Association San Diego chapter website. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, have a great thank day. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate learning from all of you. And I know that the San Diego chapter members will as well. Thank nice you. to that meet you fun. all. Yeah, nice to meet you all as well. Have a good one. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.